world with these different movements. Um, this is not meant to be prescriptive of explaining um, how to do this to other movements or anything like that, but it's just meant to be a guidebook to help us uh, get this stuff going. We're late to the game on this. Other movements and other countries around the world have been doing this and are really good at doing this. Um, so... I'm going to basically go through what I would do at the start of a people's assembly if I and another facilitator were running things. And normally we try to have two facilitators um, running people's assemblies um, of different genders. Uh, the idea there is to make sure that we are not just uh, privileging a single gender, the voice of a single gender. Um, unfortunately, I'm here today running this impromptu, and so you've only got one gender um, running this, so apologies for that. Um, hi. There will be some big movements happening to take square back. Okay, so here we're in the middle of Extinction Rebellion right now at Marble Arch, and the police apparently are moving in and taking uh, out the blockades around us. Um, so it's a bit crazy, but this is part of the follow-through of Extinction Rebellion where we get to take and that's what we're doing here is there is an existence existing system of politics of decision-making that isn't working electoral politics um, party politics winner first past the post winner takes all all of this stuff is a failed way of organizing the decision-making of our species um, and so we are Creating, or we are bringing in and introducing these newer forms, these upgrades to democracy, uh, different ways of doing uh, decision making. Um, and we need to do that because the existing electoral system is broken. Uh, the third demand of Extinction Rebellion is to create a citizens' assembly. We're not doing a citizens' assembly here today, we're doing a people's assembly, and those, those two things are different. A citizens' assembly takes place over weeks or months and it goes through a learning process. So people are selected by sortition, that sort of random selection of the population similar to a jury service. Um, people are selected, they go into a process where they then draw on the experts they want to hear from, the communities they want to hear from, who's going to be directly affected. Um, those people, this representative sample, goes through this learning process, understands the issue at an incredible depth, and then comes out with either recommendations or potentially law changes to laws um, that allow, that then shape the, the future of the country. Or the, it can be also done at a city level or whatever the other level uh, we're talking about. But those take place over weeks um, or even months. People's assemblies are self-selected. Whoever shows up are the people, the right people to be there. Um, they take place normally over, it can be a very short period of time, but often an hour or two hours. Um, there might be a teach out connected to it, where some panelists, some people with experience on a particular issue talk about an issue, uh, but it doesn't have to be that. Um, whether or not there's the, the panelists or the sharing of experience, you then go into a people's assembly um, where we have um, basically explain, as I'm doing now, what a people's assembly is um, and how to do it. And then we break into small groups, have small group discussions that are facilitated and we explain how to do that. And then we harvest those ideas, the note takers come up and share it. Um, So there are three core sort of tenets, pillars of people's assemblies. The first of which is radical inclusivity. Radical inclusivity. We want to welcome all voices. Um, we believe that there is wisdom in every single person. And so we've got to create a social technology that allows for every person to contribute. Um, Often people are socialized in, well people are socialized in different ways. Some people are socialized 
to talk more, to think that their voice is more valued, um, and um, and so and they keep getting uh, confirmation of that uh, when people agree with them or people think that their um, ideas are more valuable. One of the really stark ways that happens is with gender. Men are socialised, or if boys are socialised, to believe that their voice is really valuable. And when they say something, a group will often go, oh yeah, oh yeah, let's do that then. Women, on the other hand, and girls, are socialised from a very young age um, that their voice doesn't really count, that they don't have the best ideas. Um, and, and when they try to make a point in a group, maybe it just gets completely ignored and somebody else speaks and so there's no engagement with it. Or maybe somebody will subtly question the logistics of the suggestion that they're making or something like that. And what the, that does is it internalizes an idea that, oh, maybe it's not worth me speaking up because I don't have good ideas anyway. So this happens to all of us all the time. It's part of the system that we live in. But that doesn't mean that the people um, who've been taught that their ideas are not good. It doesn't mean that their ideas are not good. It just means there's a system that teaches that. Their ideas are often the best ideas. And so we have to have a system that includes this radical inclusivity and allows for all voices to be heard. Um, in order to create that um, system, what we say is that all people are welcome, but not all behaviours. So bullying, shaming, humiliation, sh uh, things that shut people down, you're not welcome. Um, so all people are welcome but not all behaviours. The second pillar of people's assemblies is active listening. Often when we're talking with people, we're thinking about the next thing that we're going to say. Um, and that means that we're not actually paying attention to what the person's saying and likely to miss the key and the vital points of what they're saying. So active listening is, is really central to what we're doing here. When somebody is talking, really listen. Pay attention to what they're saying. Um, just want to acknowledge there's some tears and emotions going on near here. And, uh, like, that's the kind of intensity, the space that we're in. Yeah. We welcome that and send them, send them love. So, coming back to active listening. Um, active listening means that we, we need to trust ourselves so that when we do put our hand up and decide that we want to speak, that the words will come that are the right words to say. Um, it's not that we've formulated exactly what we're going to say and we you know, know it all because we, we don't. Uh, but we've, we've got our patterns of behavior, we've got our patterns of thought. When we put our hand up, we carry on listening to what other people are saying and then we respond to them being present with ourselves at the time. Um, the third pillar um, of people's assemblies is trust. We have to trust the process. This is not, we're never going to have an ideal process, but we need to trust the process that it does actually work and it's been a tried and tested method over the years. We've got to trust each other to have the words that we, or ourselves, to have the words that are the right words to say. We've got to trust each other that we, that the people in the, um, in the groups who are sharing, the people in the assembly um, are are saying things because it's what is true to them. Um, okay. I'm referring to my notes here. I also just want to encourage people to be okay with a bit of silence and pauses. It's really hard as a facilitator sometimes to be silent but it really helps the people around to integrate what you said. So I'm just going to gather my thoughts and I'll let you listen to yourselves and integrate what you've heard so far. Okay, so the next thing that I do is I explain how the 
uh, the system is about to work, how the People's Assembly is about to work. People are going to split into groups of six to eight people. Try not to get more than eight people, um, because when you get bigger groups you get less time for each person to speak um, and less opportunity for the different voices to be heard. So six to eight people is ideal. Within those small groups, you're going to need one note taker. The, the job of the note taker, they need a pen and paper, the job of the note taker is to note down the ideas that get generated by the small group discussion. Um, towards the end of the time that you've got as a small group, and we'll announce it from the stage, um, you will, um, the note taker's task will be to go through the notes, the ideas that they've written down. People can give an indication of whether they agree with it or not. Um, or agree with something, and the note taker will try and sense the energy. Where is the best one, two, or three ideas? And the number of ideas that you're taking as a facilitator on the People's Assembly um, is based on the number of groups you have and the time you have. If it's a really big assembly, you've only got um, and you've got loads of groups, then you're probably going to want one idea. If it's a smaller assembly, 50 people or so, take three ideas. Along, or should we leave it to the end? I think leave it to the end, maybe. Yeah, okay. That's all right. Jot them down if you yeah. struggle to remember them. Um, the final task of the note taker is going to be to come up to the front and then share that one, two, or three core nugget uh, best ideas with the entire assembly. So that's the note taker. Every group needs one. The other role is the facilitator, and the facilitator is there to ease the conversation. Uh, the French word for easy is facile, and that's where we get the root word for facilitator, somebody who's there to make the process easier. Um, and there's a few tools that the facilitator is going to have uh, to do that. The facilitator's main job is to keep track of who gets to speak next. Um, and they do that by people having hand signs. So if you have a point and you want to speak, you put up a finger like this. Everybody, let's see that now. Yes, cutting up a finger. So that's, you want to speak. If you don't understand what's going on and you need clarification, you make a C like this. Now, a, a point of clarification, to make sure that everyone understands what's going on, a point of clarification sort of jumps ahead of somebody who wants to make a point. And it's just like, hey, I didn't understand that word that you just used, can you explain it? Or, I, mate, I don't know what you're talking about, can you say it in a different way? That's sort of a point of clarification. It might be that somebody whose um, English is not as strong if it's their second language or something like that, or, um, or if somebody's just talking in a very academic way, they just need a bit of clarification. So clarification jumps ahead of making a point. Um, if people agree with a point, we do this. We do flappy hands. Yeah, let's see it. Flappy hands. Um, and that feels, if you're speaking, and there's loads of people doing this, that feels really, really good. Um, so we really encourage that. We used to say, if you disagree, do this. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> but we don't encourage this anymore. Wait, I need a bit more time. Don't encourage this because if you're speaking and you start to see a load of people doing this, it could be really off-putting. And that's a way that people get shut down and then they think, oh, I'm not going to bring something else and have another go at bringing something. So we're not going to do that. Point of clarification. Um, about the fingers, <coughs> uh, I've seen fingers being used once, then two fingers. I'm coming to it. So you've got a point you want to make is one finger. If you've got a direct point that you responded to something, then two fingers goes up. And then two fingers is for a direct point, which is a really short, small thing. If somebody is saying, like, yeah, we've been here, and we've been on the streets, and we've got maybe like 800, 900 arrests this week, I'm not sure, and somebody can go, haha, 
that's not, I, I know some of the information that's pertinent to this conversation. We've not done 800 arrests, we've got over 1,200 arrests. <laughs> and then that's like, ah, that's a key point of information. It comes in, it's done, it's like 10 words or less uh, is the ideal for a direct point. Um, we've already seen a couple, well, if you, right at the start, he indicated one of the hand signs. Um, as a facilitator to, to use is round up or round off and that's just a nice way of saying hurry up with your point finish find a way to finish what you're saying because you've taken quite a lot of space now and we want to encourage other people to have a chance to speak um, the other little part of facilitating is that if you had people and you've been going in discussion for a little while and there's a few people that have had their hands up repeatedly and then somebody who puts their hand up who hasn't yet spoken, then that person gets to jump ahead of the queue, the head of the stack, and so they get to go and speak next. And that encourages people to be able to have that chance to come in and therefore we create the space where everyone gets a chance to speak. Um, towards the end of the small group discussion, you could also, as a facilitator, come in and say, I just want to open the space to anyone who hasn't yet spoken. Um, and that also encourages people to have that chance, that opportunity to speak. It's often quite hard to speak in small groups, um, let alone big groups. So um, getting those, the voices of everybody is really critical to this. So once you've explained the hand signs, um, you're, you're basically ready to start the small group discussions, um, except that you've got to explain two more things. One is how long they get, how long are they going to have to discuss. Um, ideally, um, it's something like 20-25 minutes for discussion with an additional five minutes for them to refine down to the three, two or one key points. So explain the time that they've got, and that just depends on the amount of time. Try not to make it less than 15 minutes because this is it's a really important part of it is to make sure there's voices for everyone. So 15 to 30 minutes is really good for this. Um, and then you want to put some, generally you want to put some kind of question out there. Um, we've used various different questions this week. Um, how do we, in the light of inter internationalist solidarity, how do we bring our family together again? Or what do we do next to escalate actions? Or how do we bring the ideas we've heard from the panel uh, into our own communities? Um, how do we spread the idea of citizens' assemblies and participatory democracy in our town? Whatever the question is, it's some kind of question that sets off the discussion in the small groups. Um, Yeah, and then it's basically, okay folks, so turn to your small groups. It's really good to be chatting with people that you don't know because that often allows you to just, people aren't there who, you, uh, to judge you as much and you can just, you're a bit more free to bring up your own ideas and that's often where the really juicy ideas come from. So break into your small groups and discuss. Then as a, as a facilitator, you've got a bit of free time. Go around to the small groups, encouraging the conversation. You might want to go and if, you, if you've noticed there's a group that hasn't been using hand signals, you can go up to them and pop down into the group and say, hey, so I can't help noticing that nobody's agreeing with anyone here. And they'll look at you a bit strangely and go, what? You'll be like, I've not seen any flappy hands. And then people laugh a little bit and, and they maybe are reminded to start using the hand signals and it just helps that process go a bit easier. Um, so once that's... Once the small groups have happened, they've had their discussion, you've given the five minute warning, refine your ideas, get it down to the three, two or one ideas. If it's a really big assembly, it's down to like 10 words. Then you invite the note takers up to the front um, and one after another, the note takers speak and say their ideas to the entire assembly. Um, it's often really scary for people and often the people that volunteer to be note takers are not the people who are the people who like to get up in front of mics uh, at the front of assemblies. So encouraging people as the note takers come up, get 
get people to do a round of applause, to say thank you, and, uh, and, and just name how courageous it is to come up and speak to an entire assembly. This might make people really uncomfortable, but they're doing it anyway, and that's incredible. So appreciation of what they're about to do. Um, yeah, if there's time, get them to introduce themselves and name where they're from, and then let them have the mic and say their ideas, um, and you'll go through. You also want somebody to be the note taker, the overall note taker of the People's Assembly. So that person, it could be the other facilitator, but it could be that you found a third person that's going to help you um, to take the notes. Ideally, you don't want a flip chart so that everyone can see, but if you can't get a flip chart, just do it in any old notebook um, and take those notes. <coughs> that's. I want to say that's what you do most of the time when there's an intention to do something with those notes. You don't ever want to give the impression that something's going to happen with the notes if it's not. If the point of the assembly is for people to discuss and just have a chance to discuss and share ideas and that's all that's happening, then say that. But if there is some kind of um, process that's going to follow on, let people know what it is. Maybe this has been um, a feedback session, People's Assembly to gather feedback that's going to be fed into one of the um, Extinction Rebellion working groups. Or um, there's also this online platform, rebellion.earth slash assemblies, um, that you can take the ideas and you can put it onto there. Um, and you'd have to get in touch with the People's Assembly Working Group in order to get the login to do that. Um, and there could be other ways. If you're running this in your local group, it could be that you just want to publish the ideas um, on social media or you want to like put it up so it's going to be there for the next two or three meetings on the wall. I don't know what it is, but be really clear what's happening because people want to know they've contributed to something and it's meaningful that they have contributed. Um, so that's really key important point. Um, yeah, go on. Sorry, it's like, just there's a mic check happening. Uh, just, just to say that it's like a uh, relevant at this example. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So the mic check happening there. That's another uh, social technology. If you don't have amplification, mic check. Mic, mic check. Mic check. Mic check. check. And then I would say something. And then I would say something. And you would repeat it. And you would repeat it. Thank you. So you can do that. Don't carry on now. Uh, you can do that if you don't have amplification and you need to be heard and you're not speaking loud enough into the space. Um, obviously it slows down the process so it's quite hard to do. Ideally you've got some kind of amplification to explain all of that people's assembly stuff. Um, question. Um. I just want to ask about the um, practical inclusivity and everyone's um, voice to be heard in relation to mental health issues. In, in relation to mental health issues, in the group that I had earlier on today, there was obviously a lovely young fellow who was very sweet, but he was, um, yeah, he was very scattered and um, dealing with him with the little group that we had in the decision of whether we should go or stay, we kept talking about curfews and all sorts of things. So I just wanted to know how, as an assembly, we deal with mental health or people that are just mind distorted for whatever reasons, you know, in, in groups. It's a really good question. Um, how do we deal with people who have, yeah, um, mental health issues or other way of seeing reality? Uh, than, than most of us uh, in our consensus reality. Um, I would say there's not really an easy answer. Um, if, you, if it's possible to find a way to, um, that they can find a place for them to say what they need to say um, and then allow others to speak and explaining to them, okay, you've had your time to say what you need to say, but now we also need every, other people to have a chance to speak, then that is a way um, of doing that. If they're unable to hear that, um, I think sometimes we have to admit that we just don't have the capacity or the love or the skill to allow um, that sort of people who are unable to um, to abide by the behaviours that are needed for the assembly. And so then it's a case of maybe taking that person aside if somebody's willing yeah. to do that. Um, I mean, yeah, cause, um, in our, my small group, um, I mean, I was the, you know, um, facilitator, but 
facilitator of the group, so I ended up facilitating him. But I thought, in as a bigger group, people, or maybe it's good to have people that will put themselves up as facilitators that can support those that are struggling. And you know, maybe that's something that could be as part of the great assembly for when there's issues in in, in gathering of people, so that there are facilitators for people with, with struggle health issues. I mean, if you've got capacity and you have people that are willing to do that, then yeah, they're great. Yeah, I would have thought that would be good to do um, at the beginning of each assembly. Yeah. To just say, look, guys, we've got to be aware that we've got quite a lot of people here in this group, and if there's anyone struggling with any particular person, that um, we, we, not, we will have the facilitators come and support you. Yeah, you know, I mean, that, that might be a good thing to do in the future. To offer, to offer facilitators. yourself, or maybe yeah. there's others who you know. I mean, I'd be very happy to put myself yeah. up as facilitating someone. Yeah. In, in the assembly. Yeah. 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 And that just depends on the context you're in. If you're in like a really public context yes. and you don't know who's going to show up, then it'd be great if there's other people that you trust who are running this with you that you could draw upon and it's not just the two of you, but there's yeah. loads more people and you could then assign people or people could go over and, and help yeah. out. If it's your local group and you're just running it as part of your XR local meeting yeah. or something like that, yeah. you would probably, you know, everyone would be able to step in yeah. in some way to sure. do that. Yeah. I should have done that. So. Um, yeah, so in my experience working in mental health services and I'm working with service user representatives <laughs> and stuff like that, the same thing, that I, in my experience, I find that the same thing works as it does for everybody, that as, as a facilitator, you can speak to the person's need and reflect in your active listening, you can reflect back what you're hearing is the need that's underneath, that helps all of us get right to what, we're talking about this story or what we want, the strategy to meet our need, so it's the same thing, as we can get right to and reflect back, is it, are you, you know, where they're coming from? I just want to say and clarify, I've got my phone out because I've got the facilitation training notes I just did from memory and I just want to check that I've not forgotten something. Um, There's a hand over here when you're uh, ready. There's a hand over here. Okay, I'll take that in a moment, I just want to check. Um, okay, where was the hand? Yeah. Uh, assembly because there can be a lot of bias within a, within a question. I find and it's like, how, what is, is there a good process for getting the best question? I suppose. So the yeah, thank you. The question that you ask is really important, obviously, because that's what people are going to discuss. Um, if it's combined with a teach out and you've got a panel, then um, asking the panelists beforehand what they think would be a good discussion because they know the subject better than you probably. So that's a great way. If the People's Assembly is part of a feedback process to go to a team, then ask the, the team, the working group, what is the, uh, the question that they're putting out there. If that's really not the case and you don't know, then just, um, like if you've not had a chance, ask the panellists or the experts, people with experience talking about it. Uh, I just use the word expert and I, we try to avoid that, um, but people with experience on a particular subject is maybe the better way to talk about uh, people. So, but formulating the question yourself as best you can, um, discussing it with your facilitator, your co-facilitator, um, is, yeah, there, there's no sort of guaranteed way to do it, it's the best that you've got. Direct point? Um, it's really useful to be mindful of like open versus closed questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So making sure that your question is open, it doesn't just get a yes or a no. Oh, sorry, or, what I mean by open, I mean or, like, if it's a yes or a no, it's a closed question, or if it's black or white, red or or whatever, or if it's uh, something like, how do you feel about that, it's an open question. And it's useful, they're obviously, they have different purposes, but it's just useful to be able to identify there's two different kinds of questions. So, do you think about Wait, 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 this? sorry. <laughs> with your hands. Um, um, so I'm going to take one more question and then I'll just say a few more points because it might address some of the other questions that are bubbling up. So go ahead. Well, it feels to me that you could actually ask the assembly itself <coughs> as well what they feel is the most pertinent thing that they want to discuss. So, G 
generally with decision making, um, you want to get that to as small a group as possible. The bigger the group, the more expensive the decision making. So asking a whole assembly, what do you want to discuss, is a really difficult uh, question that is a whole process in itself to figure out what the question is. So I would generally avoid that. Um, you could, that we have run a few this week that we've called People's Choice, um, where we've had people come up and people get to speak for one or two minutes about what is what is it that you want to discuss this week. Um, write them all up and at the end you go through a sorting process where you try to find out where the energy is, what's the question that's got the most energy. That can get really tricky because there's lots of people that want to do this and there's lots of people that want to do that. Um, a way to resolve that sometimes is just to get a pen uh, which you're going to spin and the direction it points is the di and you'll, you'll figure out beforehand, okay, if the pen goes in this half, we're going to talk about this topic, if it goes in this half, we'll talk about this topic, spin a pen, see where it lands, and then take the feedback. Um, if people are like, no, 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 the other one, if there's enough of that, then you can check with the, with the people, okay, so do we want to do this other one, um, and there might be more agreement. So you don't have to obey the pen but the pen is a really useful way and you can do you know, halves or you can do thirds or quadrants. I'll, I'm going to go back and explain some of the other things. I'll come to your question in a bit, so hold it right down if you need to. Um, everything you do as a facilitator models the behavior that is acceptable in a group. Everything you do. So if you at any point are raising your voice to talk over people, it models that that's okay. If you say, I'm going to take one more question and then do something. If you then take one question and then another question and a third question, what you've done is you've modelled that when you set a boundary, people can walk past your boundaries. Sometimes you might want to indicate, okay, we've got a voice of a 13-year-old, I'm going to take this additional question because I really want to take that voice. But if you do that, make sure you name what you're doing and why you're allowing your boundaries to be moved. Um, because if you just allow boundaries to get continually walked over, you lose control. People don't feel safe um, in the assembly and people just start talking over each other and the thing breaks down. So really be careful with your boundaries. I also want to encourage people, if you make a mistake, own it. Name it. I, I used the word experts earlier and then I said, ah, that was a mistake. I'm trying not to use that language. So I named it and said, look, this is the alternative that I would rather I would have done. Um, by doing so, what you're modeling for people is it's okay to be wrong and to own your mistakes and apologize for it and to try some other behavioral pattern. Um, if you say something um, that's problematic and somebody calls you out on it, hey, what you just said, that was ableist or that was racist. Find out, oh yeah, okay, maybe it was. I'm a human and I'm really like, I do make mistakes and you're probably more sensitive to this particular topic than I am, so I appreciate that you're bringing this to me and I'll try to modify my behavior, my behavior moving forward to deal with that. If you feel that the whole thing is not going very well and you're struggling as a facilitator, naming that. Just say, hey, this is really hard today. It's not going smoothly. That bizarrely creates a sense of safety in the room because now people in the assembly at least know that you're tracking with your awareness what's going on and that you're aware that it's not going well because they are also aware that it's not going well in some way. Um, I, I want to mention as well, um, because it's a core part of facilitation, I, we're coming to the end of this um, in a few minutes, but um, maybe another 10 minutes. Um, a core part of facilitation is uh, trying to find what's fair. We have a deeply ingrained some would say genetic system of figuring out fairness uh, that potentially goes back millions of years as a, a way that we figured out how to interact together as social animals. Um, and fairness um, is, is something that gets felt. 
If somebody says something that doesn't feel fair, you might feel it in your body as some kind of like twist in your stomach or a tenseness in your back or something like that. Pay attention to what's going on in your body and you will just just by noticing this, of what's going on in your body, it will give you some wisdom that you might be able to bring into the room. Um, ways that we've created patterns that are unfair are by the systems of oppression, um, like um, patriarchy, white supremacy, uh, classism, ableism, things like this. Um, so I mentioned it earlier about how people who have been socialized as men and boys are often taught that their vi voices are um, more valuable and their ideas are more often correct. It's not the case, but that's what we've been taught. Um, people who have been socialized as women and girls is the opposite. But then we've got to complexify that a bit. White people are more often taught that what they are, have to say is more valuable and they'll get listened to more. Um, People who are, are of upper class or middle class are taught that, whereas working class folk are often taught, um, you know, don't go above your station, don't step out of place, you're not allowed to say things, you're not allowed to have good ideas. Um, education comes into this. Immigrant status, people who have got uh, maybe undocumented might be really afraid to speak up uh, because they're fearing repercussions. Um, what am I missing? I, I know I'm missing some. Ability. Um, if we have people in the group who are um, who are blind or deaf, um, unable to speak, um, or have uh, physical or mental uh, differences than um, many of the people around them, they, those can all contribute to them feeling like they don't have a voice or it makes it difficult to say. Um, and it's really hard to um, to sort of hold that in every single way. You might not be, I mean, somebody who's blind is not going to be able to do the hand signals or necessarily, right? Um, in a sort of put together quick people assembly, it's really hard to deal with that and you don't always have the capacity to do so. That's the flaw of this social technology um, that isn't quite there yet. Um, I got a direct point. Also, just mentioning sometimes people who are not native speakers of the language being spoken. People who are not native speakers, indeed. Yes, thank you. Age as well. And age is a really complex one. Sometimes, I mean, with all these things, it's complex. Sometimes younger voices get privileged, um, sometimes older voices get privileged. Um, particularly, old men find themselves where they just often find that they are listened to as a voice of wisdom. Whereas older women often find themselves becoming increasingly invisible in society. Um, and so bringing out the voices of the older women, who are often the wisest people we've got after the toddlers. Um, you know, like... After the toddlers. Right? After the toddlers. Right? The toddlers. <laughs> right. No, like, they, they see everything the clearly. They've not been blinded by yeah, these yeah, issues yet. So, um, <laughs> as a facilitator... Um, i come to you in a minute. I see your hands. Uh, as a facilitator... Um, Getting to know these systems of oppression is, is an ongoing practice. Read the books about it. Why I'm no longer talking to white people about racism is a great book. Um, emergent strategy goes into these the things book? as well. Emergent strategy. Why I'm no, why I'm no longer what? talking to white people about racism. Um, that's, I mean, loads of books on, um, on, on feminism and all of these different subjects. Use this as an ongoing practice to build into your skill as a facilitator. I was just going to say, with ageism, <laughs> older women have much softer voices, and it's often a volume issue. That was what I was going to say. It's hard. When you can't hear somebody, you ignore them. You ignore what their point is. When you, when you can't get so if you can't hear someone, you might ignore their point, and so that's why we've got the speak up to encourage those voices. Yeah. Also, research has shown that higher voices, shriller voices, are taken less seriously than deeper voices, yeah, women yeah, yeah. in power. So, and there's a lot of research gone into this that, like, you're all listening to me as an authority just because my voice is deeper than some of the other people in this group. Um, as a facilitator, you also have a lot of rank. You, you get to decide things, and people listen to you and look to you. Um, Another form of rank dynamics is like psycho-spiritual 
um, rank. If somebody is coming at you with strong emotions like anger or something, if you have the psychosocial ability to like de breathe deeply, go into your felt self, find a place of inner calm, then you have a particular kind of uh, rank that other people who don't have that ability might not be able to have uh, or won't have and so you're able to you've got some privilege or some rank going on um, I'm using the words rank and privilege there um, which are all connected but they're slightly different yeah. um, rank oh yeah privilege is the things that you don't know um, often the things that you don't know um, so a, an, an example of privilege is if you run out of milk um, and it's 10 o'clock at night, you might just think, okay, so I'm going to go to the, walk down to the local store and go and get some milk and walk home again. Now, if you're a white man, that's a really easy decision and you won't even think about it. If you're a woman, um, that becomes a bit more tricky. Oh shit, there might be people out there who um, are going to follow me or it's, it's a bit more dangerous on the streets. If you're black, especially a black man, and especially if you're in America, uh, that it could be your death. The police could come up to you and kill you. And so you have to think, is it worth me going to get the milk at 10 o'clock at night, or do I just wait for it the next day? Um, we don't normally think about those things, as, so that's privilege. Rank is where we are on these systems of oppression, and that also can be institutional rank um, in terms of like a hierarchy and a job or things like that, a manager versus an employee, right, all those kinds of things. Though. I'm gonna take, I'm taking hands, so I'm not gonna take your point. I'm gonna go to this guy. So I think the rank and authority of facilitator sort of speaks to this, but it's just uh, um, from your experience of running people's assemblies this this last ten days, we kind of there's like a habitual way of getting into a conversation where we're trying to generate ideas in a group, and what I see happening kind of throwing out questions and there's a kind of conversation that isn't an idea generating. Have you got like a really lovely kind of way that you found of, other than forming the question and all that sort of thing to really keep the group focused on this is an idea generation process here and not getting into that habitual unstructured kind of conversation? Because there's value in that but it's not necessarily idea generating and the note taker takes on loads of stuff that isn't ideas. Um. I think, I mean, you could say it's the job of the facilitator to keep people on track. So if you notice that you're going a long way off the question, the facilitator might want to jump in and say, hey, we're going a long way off the question that was being, um, that's being asked. Um, that's not necessarily wrong. And so it can, the facilitator can just put it to the group. Is that what we want to be doing now? If so, let's do it consciously. The difference is between doing it consciously or unconsciously. And there might be people who say, yeah, this is actually a really rich conversation. Let's carry on. And I think this is more important than the question that's being put. Other people might decide, no, I, I want to get back to that question because I'm not actually that interested in this particular discussion. So, yeah, encouraging people to do, yeah. Um... So I'll reiterate, reiterate again, um, rebellion.earth slash assemblies uh, explains the difference between people's and citizens' assemblies. Um, it's got the, the link to the people's assembly page where you've got this manual uh, as PDF. If you find some around the camp, then we can hand them out because there are more hard copies. Um, and it also links to the online platform, the citizens.is uh, platform that we are hoping to get up and running a bit more beautifully than it currently is. Um, let's do, let's end at 25 past, so three minutes for some questions and then we'll wrap up. So, yes. I've just got one more point to be made on what gets, how things get decided on what to be discussed, because I think that's really, really crucial. And if, if, if the facilitator is, is deciding on that, then that's a hell of a lot of power. Yeah. that one person's got. So I think we need to refine our ways that we get our content. People want to discuss and the small groups go off to discuss each so one of normally, those Normally you're topics. doing a people's assembly with a particular aim in mind. It's either a teach out or it's to get feedback or something like that. Um, yeah, like I, I talked about how to do the sorting of different ideas and bring them together. But you're right, it, is, it holds a lot of power to make that decision of what is the question that's being asked. Um, a team should meet beforehand to decide on that question um, to figure it out. It shouldn't generally be you as a facilitator who's doing that. I also want to say, 
the way that we're using people's assemblies um, is not for decision making generally. Um, decision making is really costly when you do it as a group. The reason, one of the reasons that Occupy like founded, or, no, struggled, is because they tried to use group decision making um, as the decision making mechanism, and it just slowed everything down and ground to a halt. So the way that Extinction Rebellion is using people's assemblies is for idea generation or for feedback. Decision making takes place in small groups or by individuals who have got assigned roles. It's not for making decisions. We've seen some, I would say, some not great examples the last... Thank you, I'll slow down. We've seen some not great examples sometimes this week of people who have somehow indicated that there's a decision being made. Try not to use the language of voting um, that was used yesterday. We're not that wasn't a vote that took place yesterday. It was a feedback or an indication of where people are at for people, facilitators, or sorry, for other groups to then take the feedback and make decisions. So groups, um, small groups make decisions. People's assemblies do not. Yes. Now you, you, you start, just started entering on that, but I, I was just curious how something like consensus, consensus decision making, how that fits into to, to this uh, um, people's assembly. Kind of so thing. the way that we've been using um, uh, people's assemblies is is nothing to do with, to do with consensus decision making. Consensus decision making, I would say, is reserved that for groups of seven or less people. Um, you could, I, 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 we try to generally avoid consensus decision making in uh, Extinction Rebellion entirely. The only place I can see that it's got value is when you're doing an affinity group action and you're doing something. Um, illegal or there's major consequences and you want to reach consensus as a group. Even the working groups don't use consensus decision making, they generally use consent. So instead of uh, the question being, do I agree with this, the question is, does this thing bring harm? If not, can I live with it happening? Um, and so allowing things, allowing people to do things, even if you think it might be a mistake, allowing people to try things out is a much smoother way of things going and a lot faster to, for decision making uh, than consensus. So we generally try to avoid consensus decision making. Question at the back. Um, after many meetings, I'd say in Bristol and these guys are not being long, I think. Oh, of course. Um, I'm still a bit confused about this thing about affinity groups. Um, do people stay? It's another subject, but it's like. My question is, say you want to launch a proposal. Let's say I have a proposal, for example, this Sunday, two days ago, it was Earth Day. In many countries, it used to do critical mass rights. So my proposal was on Sunday, in the different towns where we have representation, to do a critical mass right in the afternoon, invite skateboards, this and that, positive manifestation, pull people in who have not made so it yet. Your question. Where do I it? Um, your question is broader than this facilitation training, so let's talk about it after this rather than talking here because you, you're, this isn't about people's assemblies specifically, this, so your question is about how does XR, Extinction Rebellion, work uh, in its decision making and its feedback and information flow processes, so let's talk about that afterwards. Final question? It was about that, who are the, the smaller okay. groups and how do, can you join them, are these small groups open to everybody? So let's talk about that outside of this. Um, is it a direct point on that same topic, in which case I don't want to take it because that's... No, it's no. okay, it's about something else. Yeah, while we were having this um, thing, I would have liked to have seen more people. I felt oh, like I was yeah. the only one putting my hands up. Does anybody yeah. agree with that? Yeah. <laughs> I, I did see other hands, so I'm not going to agree people. with that, but I... Yeah, um, I, yeah, I felt like there was agreement coming at yeah. times, and it's, it's, it's really good, and you, you'll start to notice as you use this, you'll start to be at home at a dinner table with your parents, yeah. and you'll be like, and they'll say something, and you'll be like, and they'll be like, what are you doing? Um, and yeah, or d jumping in with a direct point, um, you know, who's going to do the dishes? I did it yesterday, you know, something like that. Um, as you use the hand signals, they're a little bit addictive, um, but well worth doing. All right. Thank you all. Um, Rebellion.earth slash assemblies. Uh, you'll find the, the manual that explains a lot of this stuff. Um, and there's a video um, on the site 
um, as well with a facilitation train which will probably replace with this one as well. This is amazing. Let's get participatory democracy spread around the world, around the country, all across the land. Let's get this implemented. Loads of agreement. Thank you all and much love. Thank you. 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 Wonderful being.